Good morning. My name is David Wiley. My assignment today is to be provocative and issue a call to arms that challenges you, the delegates at this meeting and the signatories of the Declaration on the Knowledge Equity Network, to be ambitious in your efforts. I'll attempt to accomplish this assignment by stepping back and sharing a vision of the network in its broader context. If the goal of the network is to help the world overcome unprecedented challenges, including climate change, economic instability, inequality, and poverty, as the Declaration itself implies, the network will have to catalyze an equally unprecedented amount of innovation. As our current approaches to addressing these challenges are proving woefully insufficient, novel, innovative approaches are required if these challenges are to be adequately addressed. It's not the role of the network to create these innovations, of course. The network's role is to catalyze these innovations. The innovation process is typically both expensive and time-consuming. Historically, this has led those who desire to innovate to seek major funding from governments, philanthropy, and venture capital. The limited amount of funding available from these sources, combined with the expense of innovation, has led society to make relatively few investments in potential innovations that could address global challenges. If you're an academic, you may hear this line of reasoning as leading up to a call for an increase in the funding available to academics, researchers, innovators, and other entrepreneurs. But that's not my intention. The Knowledge Equity Network and its focus on open, collaborative approaches points to another possibility. Rather than eternally seeking more funding to support the increasingly expensive enterprise of innovation, what if we reduced the cost of innovation? What if we democratized innovation so that a thousand times greater number of approaches to addressing global challenges were imagined, tested, and evaluated? Dramatically increasing the amount of innovation activity happening globally will be key to unlocking solutions to global challenges. And this is true for at least two reasons. The first is that while we speak of global challenges, these challenges are all lived and experienced locally by individuals. And no matter what training or university degree or work experience you may have, you do not understand local problems like the locals do. When the time comes that we discover reusable design patterns that can successfully address critical problems like climate change and poverty, those patterns will need to be customized before they can work locally. And no one will know a priori exactly what that customization will need to look like. Consequently, the success of these reusable design patterns will depend, in part, on the existence of a broad, diverse network of innovators who can imagine, test, and evaluate local implementations. The second reason we need to dramatically increase the amount of innovation activity happening globally has to do with the power of evolution. Linus Torvalds, the creator of the open source Linux operating system, explained that power this way, quote, don't ever make the mistake of believing that you can design something better than what you get from ruthless, massively parallel trial and error with a feedback cycle. That's giving your intelligence much too much credit." Close quote. If we hope to see the kind of massively parallel experimentation Linus describes, we must decrease the cost of innovating. Linux and the rest of the open source software movement provide an instructive example in this regard. The combination of open copyright licenses and collaborative software development practices have resulted in open source operating systems like Linux, open source web servers like Apache, and open source content management systems like WordPress. Today, right now, the majority of the sites on the World Wide Web run on open source technologies, billions and billions of pages of content. The majority of the internet's technical infrastructure is open source, meaning it's free and flexible to use and experiment with. This freedom from cost and freedom to act has democratized participation and innovation on the internet on a scale we've never seen before. And this brings us back to education. Higher education, as it is currently structured and organized, is one of the approaches to addressing global challenges that is proving insufficient at catalyzing the necessary degrees of innovation. The creation of the Knowledge Equity Network is an implicit acknowledgement of this truth. Perhaps before we delve further into how the Knowledge Equity Network might catalyze critically important innovation in other sectors, we should begin closer to home and interrogate the network's potential role 
in enabling radical innovation in the higher education sector itself. As I described a moment ago, unprecedented amounts of innovation online have been enabled by an open, collaborative, and complete infrastructure that makes experimentation extremely inexpensive and fast. If the Knowledge Equity Network were to help catalyze an effort to create an open, collaborative, and complete educational infrastructure, what would that look like? Let me narrow the scope of the question to the realm implied by the text of the Declaration. Let me focus on the intellectual infrastructure of education. What constituent parts comprise the intellectual infrastructure of education? I would argue that this infrastructure consists of at least four parts. Competencies, or learning outcomes. The educational resources that support the achievement of those outcomes. Assessments by which learners can demonstrate their achievement of those outcomes. And the credentials that certify those achievements to third parties. An open educational infrastructure to have an effect similar to that of the open internet infrastructure I described before would therefore consist of at least open competencies, open educational resources, open assessments, and open credentials. The Declaration specifically mentions open educational resources. And creating and publishing more open educational resources will certainly increase access to knowledge for people around the globe. But OER alone are not a complete educational infrastructure. OER alone will not reduce sufficiently the cost and complexity of experimenting with innovative models of higher education. If the network is to enable the kind of massively parallel experimentation in education that led to the explosive growth of the internet, a complete and open intellectual infrastructure for education must be created, shared, and maintained openly and collaboratively. When open licenses are applied across all portions of this infrastructure, creating truly open credentials, open assessments, open educational resources, and open competencies, resulting in an open educational infrastructure, each part can be altered, adapted, improved, customized, and otherwise made to fit local contexts without the need to ask for permission or pay licensing fees. Local actors with local expertise are empowered to build on top of the infrastructure to solve local problems freely. Access to knowledge is a good start, but is by no means the end. Access to knowledge is necessary, but is not sufficient. I invite you to go beyond providing access to knowledge and instead catalyze dramatic improvements in local educational models around the globe by creating an open educational infrastructure. Only radical, innovative improvements to our educational models will catalyze the discovery of the radical, innovative solutions we must find to unprecedented global problems. Thank you. Thank you.